uh, that would be a very viable topic for analysis. So we need to make sure we know what we mean by persecution. It has to be well articulated, it has to be very thorough, because this is the basis in which we're going to justify and legitimize the human right to seek asylum. Point one. Point two, um, and again, we're right at the top of page 17, the, the very first line. Point two is, with respect to this right, we recognize that any time we talk about a right, as I said before, we talk about a corresponding duty, right? Right? There's a duty to respect that right. So, if we're saying that an individual population or individual person um, is being persecuted and that act of persecution satisfies the criteria, then the individual is and has the right to attempt to seek asylum. Insofar as they attempt to seek asylum, they seek asylum in a neighboring or a, a, another, some other country. This gives an obligation to another country. And the question is, is that a judge? I'm not here to say yes or no. Obviously, I, you know, I think it is. Um, human rights theorists would say it is. But it's a good contemporary discussion to have, especially prior to the formation of the welfare state, which I just said in section 5.3, is, is it fair to obligate um, another society to care for um, members of uh, probably territorially adjacent society of um, internally displaced persons, right? What happens is there becomes an international obligation, right? It's not just about the right. What's important here to discuss, and I think it, it, it should be discussed, though my, my own interpretation might be biased, I think we should still discuss it, um, is, is, is it valid for an international body to place an obligation of this magnitude on another state? It's a very simple question. The answer is not going to be easy, though, right? Is there legitimate reason to obligate another state to accept? Yes, you might have the right to seek asylum, but does that right to seek asylum then warrant a duty to, to, um, to host those internally displaced persons, right? So, uh, in a contemporary uh, example, this is going to seem totally tangential. Tangen tangential. It's not hopefully it's a little ghetto philosophy so you can get the idea. Switch gears real quick. Totally different subject. And then I'll tie it back into this so that you can have sort of an image of this, the, the severity of the obligation. Imagine that, if you will, that a law was passed tomorrow in, let's say, the United States. So imagine, if you will, that a law was passed tomorrow that says euthanasia is legal and that human beings have a right to a quality, sort of quality, sanctity of life. I'm not going to get into that. But human beings have a right to a quality death. And insofar, this is a law now, insofar as humans have uh, the right to a quality death, we are now saying that humans have a right to euthanize themselves, if they choose to be euthanized. I, sh I don't want to live anymore, my standard of living is crap, it's time for me to check out, and I don't want to blow my, head blow my brains out with a shotgun that's so barbaric. I'd rather have my family over and drink a cocktail and just pass comfortably. I want the state to acknowledge that right. Insofar as that right is acknowledged, I'm obligating someone in the medical community to respect that right. The question is, Dr. X, whoever that doctor is, is now obligated to help kill me. And this could present a huge moral dilemma for a particular doctor, right? Obviously, there would be an industry that would be created, but I'm just saying conceptually. Imagine that if you had an MD, this was something that you had to opt into. Well, that would be a huge problem, right? Wow. I understand that they have the right to die, but I don't want to do that. I don't want to be obligated by the state to have to participate in the destruction of a human life, even if it's the case that the human doesn't want to live, right? So the obligation becomes problematic because the individual, uh, this quote-unquote right that the individual has, obligates some other group or individual to contribute to fulfilling that right. The idea, the, the analogy, I think, fits perfectly. Yes, it is the case that insofar as um, people are targeted for extermination or persecution, they do have the right to flee and seek asylum, but is it, does that right to flee and seek asylum, is it legitimized? Does it legitimize the obligation to house, to host those uh, refugees? Obviously, I'm doing a human rights discussion. I think it does in some sense, but I do recognize how complicated that is. It's easier said than done. 
right? So maybe in a, this utopist world, yes, you know, people have the right. But the question is, which state is being selected? Why is that state always being selected? What's the capacity if we have a threshold, a number, at which the state can no longer take any more? We recognize that's immediately ad hoc and arbitrary. Why is it 250,000 and not 250,000 one person? Or 265,000, right? It becomes totally arbitrary. So uh, the discussion is, I think, a great discussion to have, especially at the, this might be a little bit too advanced for undergraduate, but especially at the graduate level, for students to sort of conceptualize the problems that arise in um, internally displaced persons and their right to seek asylum. Not, at, not just the right itself, but the two corresponding dilemmas. How do we qualify persecution for reasons I said earlier? And secondly, how do we make sense of the corresponding obligation to respect that right? So we're actually talking about everything other than the right. The right itself is the focus of the discussion, but rather than addressing the right itself in sort of a cliche, rehashed way, we're looking at it in terms of assessing persecution and um, assessing the obligation. And I think, I think that would be, for me at least, a more gratifying intellectual discussion than, you know, for the millionth time reading about the right, right? It's just, it's sort of the same old story that um, researchers are, and I'm not naming researchers in particular, but I've, I've read this article a billion times, right? I've read that article, you know, too many times. Okay, so I think that's clear, and hopefully that will, that will entertain um, you graduate students, I got a ton of graduate students that watch me, so I'm putting raw meat for you to put your teeth on, right? This is, this is, you know, it would be cool if when I was a graduate student, you know, in, in philosophy, if I had something like this, I'd have been like paper idea after paper idea after paper idea. I, I sort of, you know, I, I like writing papers and stuff, but I'm, I'm moving away from that phase in my academic career, but I think putting, you know, sort of putting good ideas out there for for up-and-coming graduate students to sort of put their teeth in and conceptually mill over the complications uh, is a great contribution because then, you know, it'll bring you prosperity and recognition and I will have done my part to help cultivate those ideas. So uh, I think it's a win-win for everybody to discuss these ideas um, in a non-traditional sense. By that, in talking about internally displaced persons and their right to seek asylum, it's very rarely the case that the the, the emphasis of the discussion is focused on uh, conceptualizing prosecution and identifying and legitimizing the obligation. Who does that? <laughs> what does that even mean? <laughs> Hopefully you understand what it means or else I failed my job, so I hope you understand what that meant. Okay, so um, we define refugees as we define refugees as um, da -da -da, the following. Quote, and I have the link to the quote and such, a refugee, according to the convention, and I told you the convention that this refers, is someone who is unable or unwilling to return to their country of origin, owing to a well-founded fear of being persecuted for reasons of race, religion, nationality, membership of a particular social group, or political opinion, right? So, and I mean, that could be expanded itself, you can imagine that there might be, in the future, conflict over gender, sexuality, and so on, right? Um, and for any reason that an individual could be discriminated, it's because of that that I can't go back home. Because if I go back home, if I, or if I stay, if I refuse to leave, then I'm going to be targeted for whatever the case is. Me, I like my stuff real general, right? So if the state has targeted against, I, I, I would tidy all this up in sort of a logical sort of structure. If the state targets against X and individuals within the community bear the demographic identifier X, then insofar as the state targets against X, the, the individual is justified in seeking asylum to a neighboring nation. You fill in the blank with X, right? It could be religion, it could be race, it could be, it could be political affiliation, it could be sexuality, you know, or political orientation, what have you. You could fill in whatever that is. X could stand for whatever. So we see sort of the criteria of, of the refugee status, right? There is, a, there is a threat of persecution or actual persecution of the individuals, which results in um, the forced migration of the population for any number of reasons.